Good morning, friends. Hey, how's it going? It's been a while, Denver. How you doing? Good, good. You still? Staying busy. Hello. All right. This will wait until five after. Hi, folks. Is my audio working? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. Great. OK, we'll give it until five after. Hi, Ian. Hi, Victor. Morning. Hello, Taylor. We're waiting to see who's going to join us. We're at the five minute mark. We could probably just kick it off and then, yep. you know, if people trickle in, they trickle in. Yeah. I think we're good now. Ian? You're Just getting the share sorted. Give me two secs. All right. Um, and there we have it, I hope. Is that working for everybody? Yeah, it looks good to me. Right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the meeting. Um, and to start at the beginning of the agenda, then um, this is 
theoretically, although in practice, probably not quite, um, the last of our current reign of co-chairs meetings, um, because we're due to our term expires on the 31st of March. So um, anyone who wishes to stand for any of the three co-chairs should go find the mailing list link, which is CN cnf-wg at list.cncf.io and um, stick their name in the ring for one of the three co-chairs. And if you recall, and I get this wrong, somebody will put me right. One of them is the uh, is for representing CNF developers. One of them is for representing CNF users. One of them is for representing the um, platform part of the equation. So um, if you want to stick your name in, then please send a um, uh, an email to the email list to make sure everybody knows that you're up for it. And then we can get the election started shortly. Uh, it might be a little overdue because I think we haven't got any nominations at this point, but um, sometime soon. Um, I will send a mail out to the mailing list to make sure everybody's aware that that's coming round. Any questions? I think one thing that we'll need to figure out is how we're going to process it. Last time we used a system, a voting system that Bill had set up. And I think it's open source and free to use or something, but I don't, I don't know quite how to use it. No, there's a two or three of those. Um, I seem to recall the one he had was giving us 50% German emails, but <laughs> that was probably because of the language that he had set. Um, yeah. But I'm sure we can uh, find one of those, go and recheck which one he used or find, excuse me, find another one, but we'll make the arrangements. Um, as I say, theoretically, the election should happen with the results by the 31st, but I don't think we're going to manage that. But let's try and get the nominations sorted and ready by the end of the week. Um, okay, um, I see we have a list of um, upcoming events. I will, I think, avoid going through the list as usual. Um, what I would say is you note that there's a, a handful of ones there with CFPs open, the EU Open Source Summit, KubeCon North America. Um, I imagine the fall uh, ONES is um, going to have CFPs before much longer. Um, don't forget to A, put your name in if you've got anything you want to talk about, and B, um, advertise it around here so that we all know it's coming and we can put our support in in any way that we can help you. Um, but um, other than that, um, does anyone know of any significant um, talks at any of the um, earlier forums that are coming up? Okay, then... Um, Keep an eye out for the Open Networking Edge Executive Forum, which is due first in just a couple of weeks. Um, and we'll see if we can find from the agenda if there's anything worth recommending. And then we're on to pull requests, which will involve opening the pull request page. Let's see what we can find. Three open. Um, I know I've got the best practice compliance recording one to do myself. I promised you I'd do that weeks ago and I haven't done it. So we'll set that one aside because um, it needs a bit of a rewrite based on the comments that it already has. Um, Let's hold off on that one, Ian, in case Ben shows up. Um, I did make some updates to that one if we want to criticize my attempts at coming up with definitions for things. OK, that's the best practices one, right? No, uh, it's the air-gapped environments. OK, right. Yeah, so best practices, I, I, I know. Ben made some updates, so. Ben, ben is not going to be here today. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll start with best practices and see what we find. Um, so I did an initial review. Um, I, I need to go through like really with like a fine tooth comb. Like, I mean, I, I just kind of like read it like start to finish without kind of combing it line by line, but I mean, this is going to be one of those things like when we talk about like security, um, like what is too general to where maybe it should just be in a security working group versus, you know, if it's good information, do we just put it in here because CNF users and developers might care about it? Like, 
I mean, it's it's a great series of like best practices for just, you know, Kubernetes hardening, in my opinion. Um, I do think if we're going to keep it here, we should add some stuff around um, like network security. And it doesn't necessarily need to be like firewalls and stuff, but I mean, you know, there's like things to tweak IPVS, you know, um, what IP tables does, et cetera, that we could potentially add into this. And then we either say that we're cool with having things, you know, just generic or we kind of like wordsmith it a little bit to talk about like how the best practices are relevant to either a provider a cnf operator or a cnf developer thoughts yep i mean uh, i don't want to get too wrapped up in this so that it's um, never going to get committed because it has to be perfect before we do it so um, if we can get it to a state where it's ready to go in, we should put it in and then um, fix it in place. But um, yes, absolutely. Um, I don't think anything you're talking about there is particularly asking too much. Also agreed. Like, I mean, it's probably mergeable, like almost as is right now. It's just like I said, I'm with the knowledge that we should open up an issue and like a network security section is definitely needed. And then just, you know, it needs to be relevant to the space. So, I mean, just, you know, specifically talking about bits and pieces on how, because I mean, best practice, you know, in my opinion, should also be a little bit more than just a list of, um, you know, thou shall, thou shan'ts, but also provide a little bit of context on, you know, why it is a best practice, if that makes sense. Yeah, and how you would choose more ones and how you would say they fit. Yes, it seems reasonable. Okay, yeah, seems reasonable. Any further comments? Right. There are just few, there are just few uh, uh, blending issues in, in this PR. I mean, it's just minor cosmetic things. Um, so basically the CI is complaining about trading spaces, um, some punctuation issues. So I don't know, maybe we can merge this as it is and maybe fix it later. As I'm going to say I'm willing to go in and change my thing from a comment to approve and we get this first draft in and then we just continue to refine it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was another conversation because we were talking about changing the number of approvers we required in the, the governance file or wherever it lives. And I don't think we've actually done that yet, have we, Taylor? <clears throat> no. Can you create an issue right now? to do that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Looks good. Okay. Um, yeah, I see I've got one unanswered comment here from last week, so I should go deal with that. Um, I um, This could do with a reword, um, but it is literally a reword. It's just that it's got two sections talking about the same thing. Um, this one... I need to go and revisit. I believe the point I was making is that there's a lot of, um, yeah, the, the, the wording there was just a little complex, but I don't think it necessarily has to be um, fixed actually. So um, uh, it, it just struck me that we kind of lost the, um, lost the message in the wording in a sense. Um, uh, so I'll see if I can propose a change. Other than that, I see Pankaj has, um, made a comment at the bottom, which is um, um, he may be making, yeah, he is making an extra point. So and he doesn't seem to, uh, there we are, he has changed it to and.
Has anyone got any particular issues if I just commit this actually? Hold on. I think what he wrote sounds good. Yeah, I've got no problem with it. Jeff, Victor, then yeah, I, I think it's fine. I'm also of the uh, mindset of for the commits and stuff on your PRs. If you think it's good, just commit them because yeah. the merge itself is where we're doing like the final stop gap, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, that one's gone in. Um, Right, that one seems to be resolved. Uh, Jeff wants the sp uh, Victor wants the spelling to be addressed, which is fine. I think this is also resolved, I guess. She's not complaining about that particular yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean, no issue with that. All right, fine. So we've got one change to the spelling list. My comment here wants a response. Um, and I'll go and reread it uh, if, after this meeting. Um, oops, not that one. Didn't mean to do that. Don't do that. That one. Jeff, all yours. Okay. Um, so I did this first one. I did reword it a tiny bit. Um, let me see. Doesn't have it in there. And it does say it's outdated, so. Yeah, jump over to files changed, or yeah, views changes. Let's take a peek. Um, yeah, this one's old, so there's like, trying to like navigate through all the um, former things. So I added a glossary section. Um, which is not showing up on this change log right here. Hang on, let's see if I can do that. Um, and then I slightly reworded the section that you were looking at. Um, I think some of it was, he was maybe just missing a tiny bit of context. So I didn't really fundamentally change some stuff because I feel like most people will understand. Yeah. So. I, that one right there, I addressed the one that's at the top there and added those three terms. Um, let's see. Victor was also asking for um, air gap to be defined. So I added that. Um, so this one here, let me just ask you, I don't know if I necessarily agree to just cut all that out, but I mean, it's not the end of the world. Feel like with the user stories though providing context is kind of the point but if it doesn't actually add anything then we can just commit the exception or suggestion and um ax it well i think your wording is off i mean that may break cloud native assumptions i don't think it's cloud native assumptions that you're breaking exactly as much as your um You're certainly breaking assumptions. I think throwing cloud native in there is not helping. And you're breaking one specific assumption. The specific assumption here is that um, that um, you're connected to the internet, isn't it? Well, I mean, yes and no. I think um, that's an implied piece. Like the main assumption is this notion of on demand, right? Like, and... Um, and maybe it's not necessarily cloud native, it's just quote unquote cloud. Um, this notion that like, I have resources on demand, right? Like if I want an image, I get it. I want an EC2 instance, I get it. I want a container, I get it. And um, the air gapped environment breaks one of those implicit, I get it when I want it type of um, scenarios. So, I mean,
I, I do think I agree with you though that you know specifically calling it a cloud native assumption isn't right. It's more just assumptions that cloud consumers have that everything is a credit card swipe away or a pull slash clone away. need to work on the first half of that. Um, Something like that. I don't really like that wording either. It feels like I yeah. Think. I was saying, I don't, I'm, is it that the cloud has the assumption that it has connectivity? I mean, if, if I create a tenant network with no routable IP address on the you know the floating side, then I mean, it doesn't necessarily have. I don't know. That's let's um. I don't know. We'll leave this one as an open topic. I, I agree that it needs to. I think this is closer. Yeah, that's better. Cloud software like. Because that's really what it boils down to, right? And typically, when we say cloud software, we're really talking about containers. And then there's this notion, you know, that like Docker Hub, that Red Hat's repositories, that VMware's repositories, that Amazon's repositories were always just one, you know, pull command away from I get this container image when I want it, or um, all the like nested curl commands hidden in every single installer I've seen in the last five years, where it just there's this implicit assumption that. If I want something, I can just go out to the internet and grab it. I like yeah. that wording the best that I've seen so far. Assumption that of cloud software that it has reachability to internet services. Yeah, I wonder if it's not in the right place, but I'm going to add that as a comment anyway, and you can you can consider whether there's a better way of doing it. If there, if even if there is a better way of doing it, you might just want to accept that and say, well, better than it was before. Um, the process to pull artifacts does not occur in an air-gapped environment. I'm afraid it does. Some of this is covered in the, um, <clears throat> the definitions that I added, which are not perfect, but it addresses some of these things.
Yeah, I mean, you hardly... so I talk about I talk about those in the definitions specifically like if you start doing stuff like that then there better be implicit trust to what you're going to because obviously the more holes you poke the more risk you incur in them um I, I think kind of my issue on reading this is that if you're in an air gapped environment no VPN works in an air gapped environment but you're so you're by proposing that you're weakening your constraint from a completely air gapped environment to one that isn't air gapped. Um, yes and no. Um, I mean, because the whole concept of, you know, it being a virtual private, private being the keyword is you're now just extending where this potentially isolated environment goes. But on the flip side, though, by doing that, I 100% agree. And like I said, um. Actually, yeah, it's the next section down is where I added the glossary. Like, I'm trying to like capture that exact point somewhat. I don't think I've I've got it there yet, but you know, there's going to be trade offs. Um, so, I agree. Like in an ideal world, if you were you know secure, like you're one of these super secret three letter agency um, clouds that's being built in Aurora, Colorado right now, um, they're not going to allow any of that, right? Mm. Like, and they have found ways to still build and run clouds um, fully isolated. So it's doable. It just, it takes work. And so then you have to decide for your individual air gapped environment, you know, how much risk are you willing to assume? Because every time, you know, you set a forward proxy up, right? Because it makes life a little bit easier. Mm. You're inducing risk, um, introducing risk. So So what, what would you change though, like, because I mean, the first sentence is a physically and logically isolated environment. Like, if it's physically isolated, it doesn't disallow network connectivity. There is no network to connect to. So the, the, the point is that as you've written this, there is the actual meaning of an air gapped environment. There is an air gap between this environment and others. And then there is the logical meaning of an air gapped environment, which is it is defended from others. And then there's the fact that you're talking about VPNs, which cannot be truly in an air gapped environment. So my, my point is um, you're describing a spectrum using the words that describe one end of the spectrum. I, I don't have much to offer on that other than to say, you know, in a second paragraph or a second line that actually you know, we accept that air gapped environments may be unacceptable or unusable and something slightly short of an air gapped environment in that direction is what you're actually looking for. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe we go to um, like a larger glock. Like, I was not sure how verbose to make this because to your point, like that first sentence is intentionally broad. Um, and like you said, the spectrum being full, like I have a local network that literally connects to nothing else. Like there is literally pure physical isolation. Um, it's complete intranet, right? Um, versus like you were saying, I now have connectivity, but there's a logical segregation via firewalls and I block everything off and yada, yada, which is typically what I've seen most done if we're not talking about one of the three letter agency clouds or like some yeah, scientific and, and research mind, facility. We're, yeah, we're, we're talking network functions here. They're not terribly useful if you isolate them from the network anyway, so. And then conversely, to your exact point though, um, proxies and VPNs, et cetera, are basically gap closers. So you're bridging the gap at that point. So then, you know, what does that entail? But I mean, 
but I mean, you know, collectively to the group here, like, you know, should Ian and I expand this out in this, or should we keep this one kind of high level? And do we need to like go somewhere else for like a comprehensive? Or we can just do in one more definition to go with it. I feel like we're getting back into like the early days though of I, I've I've grown to hate defining words. <laughs> I know, I know. In these and calls. I remember being the one, so I, I'm I, I entirely sympathize with this. But um if it makes you feel any better, apparently GitHub's not going to take that comment, so it, it feels the same way about it. Anyway, yeah. Um, I'll be honest, the next two definitions too, I kind of felt weird adding because I kind of feel like they should just contextually be, you know, there in the things, but I put them in because they were asked for. And once again, I'm, it's a start. I'm not 100% married or in love with the first attempt at wording this out. Yeah, I mean, you've basically said, um, you, you've almost contradicted yourself in the definition of upstream because if you can't connect to a repository, then it, how can it be an upstream repository? Well, so, I mean, and this is where, um, <laughs> Taylor, you cracked me up. Um, the, um, this is where, you know, your comment though about the spectrum comes into play. I mean, here's the thing, there has to be some means of getting software yeah. into this isolated environment, right? And I mean, so you, you are some in some way, shape or form bridging the gap, whether that is, you know, your own private repository that, you know, is able to pull from the outside world, it locks everything down before it makes it available to the inside world. Um, I mean, it literally could be someone walks into this place with a thumb drive and sticks it into the server hosting source control and starts uploading files, you know, I mean, like, this is where I think we get into actually describing like the best practices of, you know, I mean, that would be my hope, right? As we start talking about the best practices of, hey, a forward proxy is maybe not a good idea because if you get a bad image and it phones home, you know, terrible things could happen. But there's, there's still gotta be some compromises, right? Like you have to have some way of making images, source codes, OVAs, all this stuff available to the people inside that air gapped environment. And I have seen a lot of people basically just turn their private repository into a proxy because all they do is make a request to the URL of their private repository, but then it instantly just pulls it straight from upstream. So then I have the you know debate with them of why set up the private repository in the first place. Um, indeed, yes. I mean, that is a problem. It's a pinch point that you can start pinching on, but if it's not actually pinched to begin with, then it's, it provides no additional security in its current, in its base form. I think like maybe what's missing from somewhere in this like list is the notion of like, you know, quarantine or, you know, like a DMZ or like basically like, you know, here's this gap, you know, what are the airlock procedures to navigate the gap, right? Yes. And perhaps a little more on why the gap is necessary, but I'm not going to judge on that because we're not looking at the right section of the document to say you haven't written that. Um, Well, I've offered you a suggestion there, but um, I don't think it changes the meaning of what you're trying to do. I think it just helps clarify what you're trying to say. And there too, to just, you know, either make like a sub definition or add to one of the dish definitions, something around the notion of quarantining. Or control or something. Pinch point, whatever, just like. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's so not explicit enough to like talk about like, I mean, 
it kind of talks you, about it, but it you've got two kind of technological points to make here. One is that by isolating, well, three actually. One is that by physically isolating yourself from the internet, then no attack can arrive from the internet over any vector. Um, and while you would like to do this, then you're cutting, you, you know, you might argue you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. Your um, things like this are impossible if that is the thing you're trying to achieve. You've got to find a different way of doing it. Then your supply chain attack that you were making the point about earlier is that having cut yourself off from the internet, then attack vectors still do exist in, you know, poisoning the supply chain. And the private repository that you're going to need in your air grabbed environment gives you an opportunity to both filter and quarantine what's coming in to make sure supply chain attacks don't exist. But it, the quarantining part of it is not the primary point of an air gapped environment, which is that active attacks can't be made in the network. It's a secondary benefit, which is that having isolated your network, then you know you should make sure that anything that crosses the boundary is still is as safe as it can be. I feel like we're doing all the talking, Ian. I know we are. If only Taylor had some thoughts. Or oh, Victor. Akash, Denver. I'm ready for a first version of it to come out and then we do another mm. right. All right. Well, there's no comments there, but um we can assume that Jeff is going to actually try and finish this thing because I'm sure he wants it off his shoulders. And with that, we will switch to this one, which is on my shoulders and which is very old. Um, <laughs> I don't think there's been any recent, oh, no, there's been a couple of recent changes. Yeah, I, I have a guilty conscience on this. I was supposed to work on it weeks ago. I will take that and run with it. I don't want to, um, unless somebody's got a pointed comment to make about this. Um, what? That's weird. Okay, fine. Yeah, I just, I, I, I can happily discuss this, but I, I think what's going to do a lot more good is me actually going and doing some work on it. <clears throat> okay anyway yeah I'll, I'll take that um i know that nobody's adding anything to the agenda and i've run out of agenda items so um, open season who would like to say anything are there any best practice ideas or that we should focus in on and it, it, it maybe a related thing is is there anything that we would like to suggest for the test suite to start testing on even if we're not you know ready or have someone help with the best practice either an existing thing that we already agree on for testing I'm on there already. Um, I'm going to um, probably like assuming I can get this user story done. I don't know if I'm going to write like a full blown use case for it afterwards or not, or if I just start kind of maybe taking some stabs at um, different methods to, you know, deal and operate in an air gapped environment, and then at least get some conversation going. I mean, I kind of already know what my opinion is on some of this stuff, but I like, you know, there were several topics there, like how do you secure the supply chain? Um, 
what is licensing going to look like in this world? And I think um, I think the licensing one is going to be interested, interesting and definitely something that we could build test cases around, Taylor, where it's just like we do different types of deployments. We find ways to like, you know, we take in different like licensing systems. Um, you know, like if we're pushing out, you know, virtual DUs to sell sites, um, you know, what does license management look like for that? Um, we're just doing CSR spinups in our central clouds. What does licensing look for that? And, you know, different environments, different reach. Because, um, you know, as part of this too, there's going to be some level of security controls, right? Something from like pure air gap to like, you know, hey, we've poked a lot of holes to where this thing's basically a sieve, but there's still some mechanisms that are in place, right? So like, you know, just, I think an interesting one when you talk about a provider network with CNFs is, you know, just the software delivery and management, like how do I push an image? How do I cache an image? How do I license an image? Um, you know, you have the entire front end of that, which is all concerned with like the air gap piece of it, right? Like how did that image get into, you know, the ecosystem to begin with? Um, so I kind of think maybe that's where I might start focusing some of my efforts from a best practices standpoint. Um, Cause I don't know, I deal with it every day now. So it's interesting to me. All right. I don't know, thoughts? Like, is that an okay to place to start or would we want to focus somewhere else? I mean, I'm open to whatever I just. No, I mean, if, if you're, if it's something that you're more passionate about, if that's a good word to use then, or if it's something you have to deal with the pain and that's going to be easier to <clears throat> contribute information about. Yeah, and it gets um, interesting. Like, I've been exposed to more stuff, right? Like, I mean, you'll see a lot of stuff from a supply chain standpoint for certain VNFs and CNFs now where, you know, they're going to come from the factory with the software already on them, which is cool uh, until you run your first update. What does that look like? You know, what if it doesn't come prepackaged from the factory? Um, so it, it, yeah, I think um, I think it's interesting, and it's one of the few things that's also very, you know, CNF centric. I mean, it's easy to push, you know, twenty five meg container images all throughout your network. Suddenly, somebody comes in and they're like, "Here's this four gig, you know, behemoth that I want you to push to every one of your DU sites." <laughs> right. Well, do we want to get 15 minutes back? I mean, we don't we don't have to eat up the hour just because it's there. I feel like we got a decent amount done today. Yeah, why not? Cool. Thanks, everyone. You're not actually going to get those 15 minutes, though, Taylor. I'm going to call you real quick. Oh, no. I've got something I need to ask you. All right. All right. Bye, Bye. guys.